Hi, Annette Lang here. Welcome to my podcast, The History of Personal Training, or at least my experience in it. I'll just say right the outset, this is my story and it's my memories, so I apologize if I didn't get them all exactly right, uh, but it's really exciting. Uh, this is a wonderful profession called personal training. You'll hear lots of my stories and you'll also hear lots of interviews with really cool people whom I've met through the last 30 years that have been influential in my life, my experience, and the development of this profession we call personal training. Enjoy. So Billy Davis, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Um, I. I think I've met you through the years, just uh, I think maybe at Crunch Fitness Center. Uh, and so why don't you start and tell us your story about how you got into fitness, why, what you're doing now, and I'll just jump in whenever. Okay. Cool. Um, well, thank you for having me on your on your podcast, your interview show. Um, we actually met years ago at one of your certifications. Okay. I took uh, pre-postnatal with you as well as stretching. Awesome. So yeah, and that was before I lost the leg even. <laughs> Well, that's a whole nother story coming up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm currently, I'm a master trainer with Crunch Gym. I also am the uh, head Northeast instructor for P-TECH, which is um, the personal education training uh, training course uh, that Crunch offers to certify personal trainers under the NASM format. Under the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Okay. Yes, their format. So I teach and model the OPT model for uh people looking to become personal trainers. And I've been doing that in one way or another for a number of years now. Uh -huh. um, and that, yeah, this is, this will be my 11th year as a trainer uh, with NASM as my main CPT and uh, your main uh, certification, right? Personal training. And um, that's what I do. I spend about 30 hours a week teaching people to become personal trainers. About 40 you know, hours a week? 30, about 30 hours a 30 week. 30 hours a week. Wow. And yeah, so the course I'm sorry. Week, Teaching courses. Yep, yep. So now how did you, like, tell us about your background, like how you got into fitness, where you grew up, stuff like that? Sure. Um, well, I was born and raised in Kansas, uh, where I was raised by two visually impaired parents. Two visually uh, impaired parents, wow. They were legally blind. They met at a school for the blind. And uh, they were always really active. I can remember my father, before his eyesight got really bad, he played basketball a little bit, and he would ride bicycles. I didn't realize he was doing tandem at the time. Uh-huh. Uh, run, but he always had somebody with him so that he could measure distance and whatnot. And I would always bug him about wanting to do it. And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, you're too young. And then one day he let me run with him. And I did my first like three miles with my dad, uh, which was a great experience. And that was when he taught me, you know, get to the fire post and or get to the fire hydrant. Once you get past the fire hydrant, look for the car, get to the car, and <laughs> get to the stoplight. And, one of these, and then sooner or later you're done. And I took that and translated it into a really successful track and field career. Uh, in high school, uh -huh. uh, one athlete and a state track champion in the 400. Um, and uh, like I said, went to the University of Kansas on a track scholarship. So I've always been athletic and very active. Um, I moved to New York in 1998. Okay. Uh, I was with a boy band, actually, which is kind of funny. You what? But I was in a boy band. Okay. A little dancing group of guys and did that for a number of years. No and, kidding. Yeah, I came real close to getting a record deal and then didn't. And then after a while, someone kept suggesting, you should look at fitness as an option. And I did. And as soon as I got in there, I was hooked. I loved that it was a sweat equity type situation. You go in there, you do the work, you get the results. You don't do the work, you don't get the results. So what year are we talking about now? I'm talking 2007 or 2006. Okay. Um, I was, it was interesting to me that there was an actual format to building muscle not just go harder, go more, you know, like a lot, like a lot of us traditionally think before we get into the business, we just think, well, I'll just try to do more weight this day or run further or farther or longer that day. And that does it. But to learn the body as a machine was fascinating to me, the way that it operates and the way that it responds to nutrition and the way that it responds to time under tension was just an amazing thing. Um, so I fell in love with the body as a machine, which was great. Because uh, in 2012, I was in a really bad motorcycle accident and I lost my leg. That's it. That's it. That is an amazing. You have to tell that story. Okay, so um, it was 2012 May. Uh, I was hanging out with some friends at a campsite in upstate New York, 
and uh, it was a bachelor party, and you know we were grilling meat and throwing horseshoes and just kind of having a camping weekend. And uh, that weekend, I'd also planned to come back down. Uh, I'm sorry, I'd planned to come home early because a motorcycle club that I ride with had a motorcycle that they were debuting at Orange County Choppers. And uh, on from the campsite to Orange County Choppers, I ran over something that punctured my front tire, oh and my it God. for about two hours while I was riding. Uh, wait, wait, wait sorry, sorry, say that again. What about two hours when the tire leaked out? The air leaked out of the front tire for two hours, and I had no idea. So when I finally got to Orange County Choppers, my front tire was completely flat, no air whatsoever, and I didn't know because motorcycle tires stay inflated through centrifugal force. So as long as the bike is riding, the tire will stay. It'll stay. It'll work. It's when you slow down that you get in trouble. And a lot of people get in accidents that way. So when I slowed down to get off the exit, my front tire was completely devoid of any air pressure. And my bike did what's called a low side. So it slammed into the ground and slid out from underneath me. And I slid into a guardrail and I broke my leg. I, I broke my femur. I'm sorry, I broke my fibia, tibia, and compound fracture, dislocated my knee, broke my femur in two places, snapped my femoral artery, and bled out. And uh, luckily, the gentleman in the next vehicle behind me was a retiring army medic and his job in back in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq was bag tag and disposal of body parts. Wait, 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 his job was what? Bag tag and disposal of body parts. So he was a medic who was used to looking at body parts and he happened to be the next vehicle off the exit. And he also happened to have two tourniquets and a medical kit in his truck. Unbelievable. So Talk about just divine intervention. So he uh, administered first aid and then some, obviously. Uh, gave me a tourniquet. Uh, I, I was awake the entire time. We had this amazing conversation. And, you know, I, I was right there up until the chopper came to get me. And then it turned. And then we get into the cheeseburger days where I spent five days in a coma dreaming about exercise. And I'd wake up and ask for my leg or ask for my shoes and they would tell me that I broke my leg and I'd pass out and I would dream about swimming or cycling or running with one leg. And then I'd wake up and ask for my boots again and they would say, nope, sir, you lost your leg in a motorcycle accident. Oh man, I'd go back to sleep. And I would dream about cycling and running and riding with one leg. And uh, the last thing I dreamt about before I woke up the last time was uh, I dreamt about going to the Second Avenue Deli and ordering a cheeseburger. And <laughs> They, uh, for, for whatever reason, they, you know, I wasn't able to communicate with the person behind the counter. And in a fit of anger, I yelled out, can a brother get a cheeseburger and a Coke? And I woke up in a hospital room thinking I was being attacked by aliens. Oh, and my gosh. It was crazy. They were, I, I didn't know what was going on. And people were flying at me. And I was screaming because I thought I was being attacked. And, of course, you know, I'm in a hospital on Dilaudid and morphine and all these you know, heavy medications because I'd been unconscious for so long. And all of a sudden I'm wide awake and I realize I'm in a hospital room and it's dark. And the what I thought were aliens were actually nurses. And I'll never forget one of the nurses, she says, Mr. Davis, we apologize about the restraints, but you've been in a horrible motorcycle accident. And yesterday you tried to walk out of here. So we can take the neck brace off. We'll take off the wrist restraints. We'll take the feeding tube out of your mouth. But you have to promise not to try to walk out of here. Do you understand? And I looked at her and I was still a little confused and I kind of nodded because all I knew was I was restrained and I was in this room and 15 seconds before I was trying to order a cheeseburger. So she takes off the restraints and they take off the, the thing. And I look at the nurse and I say, can a brother get a cheeseburger and a Coke? I'm so hungry. And, <laughs> and those, those were my first words after waking up from a five day coma after losing my leg. So that's, I was just going to ask you, Billy. So, so you were in a coma for five days. Five days, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, when I got to the hospital, I only had fifteen percent of my body's blood volume. That's that's why I lost the leg. I mean, my uh, yeah, the femoral artery I bled out almost completely, and I can honestly say that the two things that saved my life one were the fact that someone was there to administer first aid, Matt Pinkston, but the other was the fact that I was in really good shape. I'd been training, I'd been cycling from gym to gym. That was the year that I'd done Tough Mudders. Um, I'd done a century. I'd done the Five Borough Bike Tour a couple of weeks before the accident. I was in immaculate shape with great cardio. 
So, so, to, um, Billy, explain what you mean to, to to people like like how did being in shape really help save your life? Well, um, that's a great question. Being in shape saved my life because one, uh, my body was used to the wear and tear of the workouts, so my resting heart rate was was typically pretty low because I'd been doing so much exercise and so much cardio in particular. So when that adrenaline kicked in, my heart rate didn't shoot through the roof. Um, when I was under all that stress and all that adrenaline was flooding, I had the wherewithal to calm down, breathe normally, not hyperventilate, not go into a panic mode. You know, it was it was a very physically traumatic experience. So, so your like your your body was uh, better adept uh, to handle the stress. Absolutely, my tissue tensile strength was strong. You know, my body's ability to just stay calm and pump blood regularly without freaking out around it. I mean, you know, that that was that had everything to do with me living through that accident. Wow, so what happened then? I you know, I what, what do you then when? So After, you you get out of the hospital and you say what the heck happens now? Yeah, yeah, I spent I it, I was in the hospital for four and a half months. From, and this is where 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 which hospital like when we're in New York? I was in Westchester Medical yeah. under the care of Dr. David Asperinio, who's one of the best uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons in the Northeast. He's a master surgeon and he's a teaching instructor at Westchester Medical. Um, I was there for four and a half months. They did. They took incredible care of me. Um, I came home and I I was actually home for another two months after that, kind of healing up because you know you still have the wound vac and trying to figure out what I was gonna do with get a prosthetic leg or not. And uh, lo- about six months after the accident, I returned to work with a wound vac on crutches and went back to training. I mean, I thought about doing other things but at the end of the day, I knew that no matter what happened, me being in better shape was going to make being an amputee easier. And everything about all the, all the pitfalls that can happen with being an amputee are they're pretty significant. Amputees have a very high high rates of alcoholism, opioid abuse, obesity, heart disease. A lot of this was from being sedentary, gaining weight you know, eating from, from feelings, you know, you get depressed and everybody brings you food and sure. good stuff. It's got sugar, it's got fat, it's fried. So there are a lot of comfort eating going on there. Um, and I knew just from my fitness background that all of those things were gonna be made, were gonna make being an amputee harder. Putting on 15 pounds doesn't make you walking around with one leg any easier. Having high blood pressure, type two diabetes, being out of breath is just, br- it's rough anyway but being an amputee, it's that much more difficult. So for me, it made sense to make sure that I was in the best possible shape so that I could better, you know, maintain my health after the amputation. And all of that starts with, you know, eating healthy, keeping a good life, a healthy lifestyle, you know, eat everything in moderation, making sure I do things that keep my cardio, uh, keep my cardio health up. And, you know, for me, it landed, it looked like triathlons. So I jumped into doing triathlons. Wait, so so you're you, you're wondering like, do I get a prosthetic leg? And then you think, okay, I'm going to do triathlons. I I woke <laughs> well when I was like I said when I was in the coma, I said it was five days, but about every 14 hours I would wake up, and I would always and the conversation was always, where am I? You're at Westchester Medical. Did I lose my leg in a motorcycle accident? Yes, you did. Damn it! And then I'd go back to sleep. But when I would go back to sleep, I would dream about exercising with this one leg. But the only three things that I ever dreamt about were cycling, running, and swimming. And when I woke up, I remember very distinctly having the thought of, okay, I ran sprints in college and I don't like distance. Learning how to run distance is gonna be good for you. I remember thinking, I love to cycle and that's something I can already do. I just need to learn how to do it again. That's gonna be good. And then swimming, when is it ever a bad thing to learn how to swim? And I grew up in Kansas around no natural bodies of water and, you know, like for us, swimming was like you go to the lake and you kind of float around on a tube or you jump off of a quarry into a thing and then you kind of dog paddle to the edge. Right. Like, I'm going to swim a mile. Like, nobody ever did that. So it just made sense. Like, the hardest thing and the scariest thing I could think of was I need to learn how to do a triathlon. And if I can do that, being, a, being an amputee has got to be easier than being a triathlete. And being a triathlete will make being an amputee easier. So to me, it just made sense to start doing triathlons. Wow, that's an that's an amazing thought process. What you just said. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's 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 sometimes I think about it and it's kind of odd, but that's that's the way it made sense. 
you know, and, and I also think that too, growing up with two visually impaired parents, I watched my parents make their way in a world that wasn't necessarily going to acquiesce to them. They just figured it out. And everything about training for a sport, especially something like a triathlon, translates better into the lot into your other the rest of your life. Making sure that you're organized with your time, making sure that you manage your nutrition, making sure that you know you pack light and efficiently with not everything that you know everything that you need, but in an organized way. Like even packing a triathlon bag helps because you know when I'm not packing a tri bag, I'm tracking packing a backpack. But I need certain things to make sure that I can manage the legs throughout the day. So you know finding the best towels and always having alcohol on you or whatever that is. Right. All kind of translated from triathlon to real life so it's so how, how like how long after you got out of the hospital did you actually get the prosthetic leg um i got my first prosthetic uh, about two months after i got out of rehab and i had that prosthetic for about four years and then last year in april i got my first uh sports tri- sports prosthetic i got my running leg and then before right before the new york triathlon last year i got my cycling leg so and so now um, you're you're competing in triathlons, yes, ma'am. and you're doing the education. And are you also doing personal training? I do personal training, uh, and I also, uh, I, yeah, I do a personal training for Crunch as a master trainer. I teach their personal training education program. Um, I also work with some other companies doing some other things around fitness and health and wellness and beauty. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a fitness entrepreneur. I you know, all things fitness and, and, and business wise, I'm, I'm into, um, I've done some motivational speaking, which I enjoy doing very much, you know, anything to go out there and spread health and wellness to the world. I mean, you know, if I'm not, excuse me, I I think that I've been put in a unique situation for which I'm uniquely qualified. You know, I happen to have the gift of gab. I love to read. I love fitness. To me, the body is this magnificent machine and it amazes me what it can do, especially when it's, when it's put through the ringer, so to speak. And, you know, as a full, as an able-bodied person, I was a very athletic, very, you know, competitive person. As a challenged athlete, it just, it lands as, for me, it's like just more of a challenge. Can I do a triathlon on one leg? You know, like, you know, that, that to me, that's fun. It's, and it, and if it touches moves and inspires people, I'm happy to do it because we really need more, you know, we, as you know, you know, obesity is an epidemic heart disease, cardiac disease, uh, you know, type two diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, like all of these things are, they're ravaging our country, especially if you're a person of color as I am, or if you're an amputee, which I also am. And all of these things can be remedied by a healthy diet and a healthy uh, exercise regimen. So I'm just kind of taking it to the extreme in that aspect. I think that's so, um... That's really inspiring. Um, I, I always ask everybody uh, two questions. Uh, wh- what what pearl of wisdom can you give to somebody who's thinking about getting into the fitness industry? You know, like just um, something to keep in mind. And somebody who does not know us in fitness, what would you tell them about who we are and what we do? I know you said some of it already, but... To the fitness professional, I always say the same thing. People, do it, people don't do what you say, they do what you do. So if you're gonna be in the fitness industry, find a way to live a fitness-based life. And that doesn't mean you have to do triathlons or bodybuilding competitions, but you know what that is for you. And I, I found over the years, as I'm sure you have, you show me a trainer that never eats clean, I'm gonna show you a trainer with clients that never eat clean. <laughs> you show me a trainer that never does cardio, I'm gonna show you a bunch of clients to that trainer who refuse to do cardio. So be a product of the product, a student of the game, walk the walk. People do what you do, not what you say. That's what I would say to fitness professionals. Um, And if you're gonna if you're gonna try to be a trainer that doesn't work out, doesn't eat clean, or whatever that is, you're gonna be very lonely. You're gonna have too much time on your hands. Um, To people that don't know fitness professionals and want to know something about us, I would say that we're people too. We're real people too. You know, yes, there are genetic freaks in our industry, former athletes and Olympians and just people who have always, they, they look at a sport and they absorb it like Neo in the Matrix, you know? There are those people. But by and large, most people I've found in the fitness industry are people that have just figured out that if you if you put enough time and tension under yourself, you, you have success. And it's about being regimented, it's about 
you know, it's about being dedicated and it's about not quitting. It's not that any of us are so amazing that we just never fail or we never fall short. We just keep getting up when a lot of other people would stop. And I think that in a lot of cases, you know, my story is very much that, you know, I often get, man, I don't know how I could do what you do. And if I lost a limb, I don't know what I'd do. And for some people, it would be a, it would be the worst thing that ever happened. But I would like to think that most people would rise to the occasion and that most people you have, have no idea what they're capable of until you're absolutely painted into a wall. And for me, losing a limb, you can't get painted into much of a, more of a wall than that. Like you can, you can cry, you can complain, you can call your mom and throw a hissy fit. And when it's all done, the leg is still gone. So what are you going to do? And I say, throw your hat over the fence and then go get your dag blasted hat. That's awesome. Well, listen, I want to thank you again for for talking with me and uh, hopefully we'll catch up again sometime soon. Oh, it's my pleasure. I hope that we do. I absolutely adore you. Um, I hope that your ears burn regularly because I speak about you every single time I teach my course. It's a six week course. And every time we get to anything about prenatal stretching, certifications, entrepreneurs, master trainers, New York fitness icons, anything like that, Annette Lang's name comes up. So I hope that frequently your ears are just ringing and burning for what you would think would be no apparent reason. That's what that pain is. No. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Billy. I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you.